Hello, and thanks for joining us again at Woodstock Community TV. Uh, we're doing a series of interviews of local candidates running for office. Today, we're sitting down with Dana Colson, who is running for Senate in Windsor County as a Republican. Uh, Dana, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you for having me. Thanks for your time. And, and so why don't you start off by introducing yourself, give a little background, um, who you are, uh, what your experience is, and then we can get into the, the political side of things. Sure. Yeah, so I was born and raised right here in the Upper Valley. Um, born at Hitchcock. Um, spent most of my younger years in South Royalton, growing up on a farm. Um, after uh, high school, went on to college at Vermont Tech, got a degree in engineering, and later a business degree at uh, Franklin Pierce over at their West Lebanon satellite campus. Uh, spent decades working for businesses, private business, uh, both nationally, uh, internationally, and locally. Uh, those decades of experience uh, give me a lot of business, real world experience that uh, I bring to the table. What kind of farm did you grow up on? Uh, I was dairy farm, small dairy farm, but we also, uh, my grandmother sold eggs and maple syrup and vegetables off the front porch. Uh, did a little sugaring, uh, primarily for our own uh, syrup. Um, so it was real Vermont farm, you know. Is the farm still in operation? No, my grandparents have uh, passed on. Um, but uh, most of the farm is still in the family. Um, my brothers have split some of that land and built log cabins there. and um, Still do some gardening and haying. And but no more dairy farming? No more dairy cows, uh -huh. sadly. This actually yeah. wasn't on my list of questions, but now that we're talking about it, the, the, the issue of dairy farming in Vermont is, is a very challenging one. Um, yes. The number of farms it keeps dropping. It seems like it's getting harder and harder for family farms to stay afloat when there's so much consolidation Correct. going on. Um, do you have any ideas for how Vermont could help its ailing dairy farmers? A lot of things the state can do. The Vermont Department of Agriculture is already working on some of those. Um, First, you got to look at uh, milk and meat processing. There is a shortage there. Uh, for example, uh, most of the slaughterhouses are booked a year in advance. So if farmers wanted to raise more meat, um, they don't have the capacity to process that meat. So if we focus on increasing that capacity first, then that trickles down to the farmers being able to produce more, get it processed and sold. Uh, same with milk. Um, you know, we had a, an organic operation um, where the processor decided they were dropping Vermont farmers uh, and New England farmers. And so the state had to scramble and try to find other processors to take on those organic farmers. Um, so that was also, you know, an emergency crisis on the processing side of things. Um, on the farmer end, then there's tax issues. Um, you know, as far as uh, property taxes and um, current use program, you know, I think that should really be to the benefit of the farmers who are currently using the land in farm production. Um, so those those are issues that we really need to discuss and look at uh, to help the farmers. So when you decided to run for Senate, uh, what, what was the major impetus behind you wanting to get involved in state politics? Well, I've followed politics since I was a kid. Um, always read up on it, was always interested in it, and thought, well, someday I'd get into it. And in recent years, I've seen the trend, uh, I think Vermont going in the wrong direction. Uh, affordability's been a huge problem, even more so uh, at this time. And 
I'd like to see us tackle that issue. Um, too many people just can't afford to live here anymore. And it's sad to see those data Vermonters leaving um, for more affordable states. With everything that's happening now with inflation, the price of food and gas going up and down all the time, what kinds of things do you think Vermont as a small state could do to alleviate some of that? Well, number one issue I'd look at is some of our regulations that are making it hard for businesses to do business here and to build housing, for example. Um, I wouldn't totally scrap Act 250 because the original intent, I think, was good. Uh, it was intended to regulate, you know, big ski area development. Uh, but I would exempt some of the smaller projects. I think it's been gone too far. Uh, for example, I know a couple in Tunbridge. They retired. They decided they wanted to subdivide their property, build a new house next to the or to their old one, and sell the old house to their son. Uh, because Tunbridge had no zoning and the number of acres they had, Act 250 kicked in. It cost them $10,000. Well, why is housing expensive? Well, they just added $10,000 to the cost of their home just to get a permit. Just to go through the process. Right. Uh -huh. So that's one area where we can save some money for the homeowners, reduce the cost of housing, uh, encourage more housing, which we have a shortage of. Uh, I have another example. Um, had a business associate in Barry Town, or Barry City. Uh, he owns a machine shop has a second floor. He is surrounded by apartment buildings. He wanted to simply finish the interior of his building and put an apartment in the second floor. The city refused him. The structure is already there. He wasn't changing the exterior structure of the building. Water, sewer, power. He's surrounded by apartment buildings, but they wouldn't let him put an apartment in his building. That's why we have a housing crisis. That would have been very affordable housing. Well, it seems like the Scott administration is wanting to try to solve some of these problems. We just got a bunch of federal money um, that they're trying to use towards some of these issues. Um, renovating homes so that people can rent out space to small families. Um, but it seems like a lot of that money could dry up eventually since it was federal pandemic related money, and then once it's gone, we're still left with the same problem. Um, are there any any ideas for bills or other laws that you think need changing to address specifically the housing crisis? There's first the permit side. I mean, the permits can add up to 30% of the house, housing costs. Um, that to me is unacceptable. Um, and that doesn't cost any money to cut some regulations. Um, then, for instance, building materials. You get 6% sales tax we're paying on building materials. 5% uh, of the state's revenue last year was from sales tax. So if we could find 5% in cuts in the budget, we could eliminate that sales tax altogether. Um, it's doable. Um, then, you know, you got to look at the market, supply and demand. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, people fleeing the cities due to the COVID and the, the ability to work remotely uh, coming into the state. Um, roughly half of the housing is being bought up by out-of-staters who have more money than Vermonters. Uh, and because there's not enough high paying jobs here in the state, uh, Vermonters are priced out of the market. It sounds like child care is also an issue for a lot of families. They can't either find or afford child care, which makes working a challenge. Do you see any solutions for that? 
Yeah, again, I would look at the regulations and I would start with the providers, bring them in the state house to testify, okay, where can we tweak the regulations to help you out? Uh, that's a good starting point. Uh, I know there's a push um, from some groups to make the providers um, have teacher certificates. Uh, I think that's going to be counterproductive. Uh, it's going to again decrease the supply uh, and you know it's a supply and demand issue and if we keep de decreasing the supply the price and availability is going to be a problem. So it sounds like you really want to try to streamline government regulation yeah. for a lot of these areas to make things go a little smoother. Yeah, just bring some common sense to it. Do you think that, that, that Vermont historically has been too cautious with regard to having these strict regulations and that we can like ease up in some areas without sacrificing our environmental quality? Yeah, there's certainly one of the issues I've brought out in the past was, for instance, the city of Burlington dumping millions of gallons of sewage into Lake Champlain. I have a problem with that. I don't think that's very good environmental stewardship. Uh, and that stems from decades ago when the sewer systems and uh, uh, water runoff was all combined. And so when you get a big heavy rainstorm, it overwhelms the system, it doesn't have the capacity. So to prevent sewage from backing up into people's homes, they release it into the lake. Uh, I would separate those storm water systems and sewer systems and have the storm water go off on its own, um, you know, filtered through crushed stone and before it reaches the lake and the sewer system handles sewage as you know it should. Uh, and that process takes some time, you know, streets have to be tore up one by one, repiping everything. Um, and I, I know this last budget, the governor put some money into that in some areas, and I congratulate him on that. Um, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, so we need to keep, keep pursuing that. And, uh, another area uh, in the environment I'm concerned with is cancer-causing chemicals. You know, those are detrimental to human health. Cancer is a big issue. Uh, that adds to our health care costs as well. Uh, so it's better to stop that at the source rather than spending even more money dealing it with it on the tail end of the situation. You mentioned Governor Scott. How, how do you feel or how would you rate his performance as governor, as a Republican governor, uh, dealing with major, large majority, Democratic majorities in the House and Senate? Well, I think he's doing the best he can. Um, I'd like to see a few more uh, Republicans up there to help sustain his vetoes. Um, you know, you've got to work with what you got. So you're running as a Republican in what in recent history has been a pretty blue county um, in terms of Senate representation. Right. How do you, what do you feel about your chances now that we have, there's an opening um, with, with Alice Nitka stepping down? Yeah, I think my chances are good. Um, we're out there working hard for the votes. Uh, I believe there's a lot of swing voters and, you know, affordability has only gotten worse and the only people you can blame are the ones who've been running the system up there for years. Um, you know, if you want change, you got to put new people in to bring that change. It does seem like given that, that a lot of Vermont voters who might vote for a Democrat for their uh, representative or senator vote for Phil Scott for governor, that there is this right. desire for some balance in Montpelier. Correct. Um, and it seems like that balance will be sustained. Uh, I think Governor Scott remains very popular. Uh, even in even in a blue state where we have a Democrat running for governor, uh, the consensus seems to be that this is Phil Scott's election to lose. Yeah. Um, I agree. I mean, I'm a moderate as well. Um, looking to reach cross party lines, you know, whenever 
you know, if the other side has a good idea, I'm all ears, you know, ready to listen and work with them. Uh, so, you know, I'm not extreme right, extreme left. Um, I believe with working with people and uh, finding the best solution to our problems. So if, if you are elected to the Senate uh, in November, do you have any preferences for, for what committee, what two committees you'd like to be on? Haven't thought about that a lot. Um, I certainly am interested in budget issues, um, being my business background and uh, would make me an excellent candidate for that uh, type of committee. Um, you know, I have a background in agriculture as well, um, having grown up on a farm. Uh, but um, yeah, I think financial issues, the, the economy, those, those are the main focus uh, that I think really affects all the voters and uh, that's where I'd like to focus my attention. Can you talk a little bit more about your, your business experience and, and how that would could lend itself well to being a legislator? Yeah, so in the engineering side of things, I was often a problem solver. Um, and I'd look at an issue from all perspectives and try to find the best solution. So I have several patents, um, both in the US and the European Union. Um, and for instance, I worked a lot with plasma torches and plasma torch design. I would literally be dreaming about designs in my sleep. <laughs> um, and traveling the world, I got to experience different cultures and different people working, all kinds of people. Um, and did a lot of trade shows. Uh, got to see some unique things, uh, for instance, in Brazil. Um, they were in energy independent. Um, you pull into a gas station, you've got your choice of three different fuels. Uh, you could use regular gasoline, uh, you could use sugar cane ethanol, or you could lift your hood, connect the ground clamp, and a hose quick disconnect, and fill the propane tank in your trunk with natural gas. And for instance, they we were driving a GM car and there was a, simply a toggle switch under the steering column where you could switch between fuels on the fly with no hesitation in the motor. Um, and that was probably 15 years ago. Um, so there are technologies out there that may not be common here, but they're common elsewhere in the world. What do you what do you think about Vermont's efforts to transition to electric vehicles? Well, I think we're going to have some problems with cold weather. Um, for instance, with my business, I own delivery trucks, uh, 5,500 series uh, trucks. On average, I run 200 miles a day, loaded heavy with hills. Um, I researched an electric truck out of curiosity. Uh, nobody manufactured one. Uh, you could, there was a company that would retrofit a cab over style truck. Uh, the problem with that is first, um, I'm sure it was pretty expensive. They didn't list the price. Uh, but under perfect conditions, with no load, flat ground, normal average 70 degree temperatures, uh, the range was only 130 miles. That wouldn't work for my business. Uh, I would be interested in hybrid truck. I'd love to save fuel. Last year I spent 30,000 in fuel. This year I'm projected to spend 50. Um, Cars, that's a little different situation. You know, you're not worried about carrying a load. Um, I think hybrids make more sense for Vermont, but if somebody wants an electric and it fits their lifestyle, great. Do you think that we need to find a way to transition off of petroleum fuels? Over time, uh, I don't think you can flip a switch and just switch over. Um, you know, there's, in, possibilities of hydrogen as well. 
Um, but I think, you know, it, it's a process that's going to take time uh, as the battery technology gets better, um, the infrastructure for charging or hydrogen. I mean, I personally, because I'm in the welding supply business, I have access to hydrogen um, in the bottled form. Um, you know, if I was going to run trucks on it, I would probably want it in bulk. Um, and most people are not going to have access to that right away. Um, so that's something that, you know, we got to rely on the manufacturers to develop the technology and, and then the in infrastructure to be there. Um, in the meantime, I mean, a lot of diesel, you could be running biodiesel, you know, that's available. Um, I would be interested in seeing that expanded. Do you think there's anything more we could be doing with regard to public transportation or is that too much of a challenge given the rural nature of our state and people being so far from where they work? Yeah, that would be costly uh, for a rural state. Um, you know, certainly you're not going to be going out all the back roads, dead end roads with a bus. It's just not cost effective. But utilizing the park and rides to major, you know, shopping areas or hospitals, for example, where you've got, um, you know, senior citizens who can no longer drive or um, somebody who has lost their license for some reason um, who need that public transportation. Um, so there, it'll play a role. Um, it's not, you know, I don't see it going out all these back roads, for example. Given the, the schedule of the legislature and the low pay, a lot of people have a hard time uh, running for office and, and staying in office because they either can't make enough money to support themselves or they have a, they can't run their business. Is this, have you thought about this? Would this be a challenge for you or would you, or would you be able to adjust your, your schedule and your lifestyle to meet the legislative schedule? Well, it is a challenge for anybody running a business. Um, given fuel prices are high, um, I would, my, some of my routes would become every other week routes instead of weekly routes uh, for my business. Um, and I may have to hire some help to, to maintain the business while I'm serving in the legislature you know, January through about the 1st of June. Um, you know, I do most of my paperwork nights and weekends, so I'll continue doing that. Um, but I'll find a way to make it work. And so how, how are you going about your, your campaign? You have a lot of ground to cover, uh, yes. a lot of different communities, a lot, of, a lot of people from different walks of life. How are you finding that process and as you go about trying to convince people yeah. to vote for you? Well, I'm really appreciative of all the support I'm getting. Uh, we've done four parades, uh, the Tunbridge Fair, um, got a lot of very encouraging uh, support there. Um, I've had some donors um, stepping up uh, and volunteers. Um, we're working on a lot of different advertising channels to get uh, information out to voters. Um, we've done some sign waves. Um, uh, an article published in the Valley News recently. Um, so we're working on all fronts and uh, working hard and not going to let off the gas until November 9th. We haven't talked about health care yet. Uh, I know that insurance rates are going up for people and a lot of people uh, have to wait for procedures. Um, this is another one of those areas where Vermont is a small state. Our options are very limited to how we can improve systems like these. Yep. Do you have any any thoughts on, on what we could do in the healthcare sector? Yeah, I'm a big proponent of choice and competition. I think that improves the quality and drives down the cost. Um, for example, uh, insurance, you know, if we could purchase insurance across state lines, increase the competition there, um, that would 
help with the insurance rates. Um, as a patient, I really like the high deductible plan with an HSA account where, um, for instance, if I want to go down to the uh, optometrist or the dentist or the pharmacy, I just swipe my card and it's paid. I don't have to fight with the insurance companies for reimbursement. Um, that very simple, easy, um, the billing isn't an issue. Um, providers, um, I recently had a conversation with an optometrist um, and he wanted to expand his operation into LASIK surgery, which he had been trained, um, but because of some regulations prevented him from doing that. Um, so I'd like to work with him and get into more detail on that uh, so he can pursue that. Um, there's, uh, you know, training of nurses and professionals. Uh, Vermont Tech has really stepped up in that area and I'd like to see that expanded uh, even further. As a Republican, I assume you have some thoughts on the Second Amendment and guns. It's, it's always, it's a perennial issue in the legislature and it's, there's always a fight, a fight around it. Uh, yeah, so I grew up with guns. Um, my father and his father were both in law enforcement. Uh, my, my father was actually a Windsor County Deputy Sheriff for many years right here. Um, and my family hunted. We grew up on the farm. We had land to hunt. And uh, so I learned at a very young age, um, you know, how to safely handle guns and took hunter safety in elementary school. Um, and that's been a Vermont tradition that I'd like to see preserved. Uh, so I'm very much pro 2A. Um, another, um, as far as safety issue, um, for instance, in a lot of rural towns, um, if somebody were to break into your home in the middle of the night, what are you going to do? Uh, law enforcement, the state police may not be on duty at that hour. Uh, it may be an hour or more for an officer to respond. You are on your own. So how are you going to defend yourself? Um, that's a real issue. Um, you know, and if, you know, people wanted to take away your guns, the criminals do not obey laws. They're, they're going to get a gun one way or another. Um, so disarming the honest people, I think, is counterproductive. Well, do you have, do you have concerns that, that people in Montpelier want to do that, to disarm people like you and me? Yeah, yeah, I think there's some up there that do. Um, I would hope the majority would, uh, you know, exercise a little common sense in that area. Um, there are issues of mental health that we need to do more with. Um, and, you know, for instance, some of the drugs that some of the doctors prescribe will have side effects that make people suicidal. So we need to be careful about that as well. What about these so-called red flag laws if if someone is is deemed to be a danger to themselves or others, uh, having their access temporarily removed? Well, again, people need to have their day in court before, um, you know, I don't want to see, you know, false accusations against somebody and then having their constitutional rights taken away. I'm all for background checks, um, you know, and improving that process. Um, but I don't want to be taking away somebody's constitutional right unfairly. What if a judge determines that someone poses an imminent threat to somebody else and rules that they have to have their, their guns taken away temporarily? Well, I think they should have their day in court first and hear both sides um, before the ruling. I, I don't want to see um, 
you know, somebody's rights taken away without just cause and having their say first. Did you agree with, with Governor Scott signing that bill into law a couple of years ago, the firearm bill? I think there are some constitutional problems with that, um, ultimately, um, whether it sees its day in court and how the judges rule, I'll leave that up to them. But uh, that's my feeling. I, I do not support that uh, law. And uh, you know, that's, that's one area that I wish he had vetoed. Are there any other bills you think Governor Scott should have vetoed? I think he's done a pretty good job with the veto pen. Um, I can't think of anything specifically where I wish he had of. Um, I know it's, it's tough with the numbers in the Senate and the House. Um, so he's got a tough job balancing things there. Who will you be voting for for uh, Senate at the federal level? Well, I'm focused on state. Um, uh, I, I've worked with Gerald Malloy. Uh, I think a lot of him. Um, so I, I think he will have my support. One, one thing I love about Vermont is that as, as bad as, as the partisanship and the political divide gets in the rest of the country, Vermont seems to be pretty level-headed. Uh, Republicans and Democrats, for the most part, get along, and you certainly seem like a level-headed, moderate Republican Correct. who would get along with Democrats. Um, but do you have any concerns about this growing polarization taking hold in Vermont and getting to a point where people just can't see eye to eye or talk through problems? Well, I have seen some cases of that. Um, some people very fired up over the issues out on the campaign trail. Um, you know, I like to step back and kind of look at the facts of the situation um, and not deal um, on an emotional level so much. Um, you know, we all have our feelings, but you know, you got to pause for a moment and think the situation through and um, really focus on what's the right thing for Vermonters. We haven't talked much about education. Um, yeah, I'm a big proponent of technical education and I would treat all schools equally. Um, that's actually a big issue here in Windsor County. Um, my opponents on the Democratic side, uh, because of a recent Supreme Court decision, um, on tuition dollars going to religious schools. Uh, they uh, would defund or uh, limit uh, taxpayer tuition dollars from going to independent schools. Um, we've got a lot of independent schools here in the county. For instance, Sharon Academy, Thetford Academy, Black River, Mid Vermont Christian. Uh, that would cripple those schools. Um, I would support those schools and leave the tuitioning system as is. Um, small towns such as Sharon that don't have a high school, parents have a choice. They can send their kids to public or independent schools and the town pays a standard level tuition rate and if there's a difference the parents make up the difference. But, uh, Typically, majority of that cost is covered uh, through tax dollars, and those parents are taxpayers too. So um, and these schools here in Vermont are very good independent schools. So I wouldn't, you know, take that away from the parents uh, or the kids. Um, you know, I, I believe, you know, my opponents are following the NEA position, um, but I'm interested in Vermonters, um, not a special interest group. Do you think property taxes in Vermont are generally too high or that the money is not well spent uh, or are we, getting, are we getting a good return for our investment? 
current use program something I would take a look at the rules on. Um, you know, I prefer to see that geared more to the farmers uh, rather than maybe some wealthy landowners who have no intention of developing the land anyway. Um, so that the tax dollars or you know taxes can be high. Um, one of the issues, for example, in Sharon, I've gone to a school meeting to vote on the budget. It'd be lucky if there was 10 people there voting on the budget. If we had required that to be on the Australian ballot on town meeting day, we might have 100 or 200 people weighing in on the budget. Um, so including more people in on that vote, and it quite frankly is the voters' own fault for not going to the meeting. Um, I realize some people may be working, but uh, I think there's probably more than 10 people not working in the town of Sharon at the time of the meeting. Do you think that town meeting day should be a state holiday so more people are able to attend? I do. Yeah. It seems like that's that's a that's a New England tradition that we need to to hold on to and strengthen and get more people engaged. Um, yes. I'm always surprised by you know how how small a percentage of the town's residents come to the town meeting. Even if the town halls are full, it still is only a fraction of the people in the town. Yeah. Um, and they make decisions that the rest of the townsfolk have to abide by. Right. Um, so you mentioned your support for technical education and that that's certainly something that's on the minds of a lot of people now that we're trying to build all these new affordable homes for people. We need contractors, plumbers, electricians. Uh, I know in my experience, getting an electrician or a plumber, it's it's not easy. You have to wait a while until they're free because everyone is so busy. Right. Um, so it seems like we, we could be investing a little more in technical education so that we can be uh, creating new generations of, of tradespeople to, yeah. help, to help us meet our housing needs. Correct, yeah. So being a graduate of Vermont Tech, um, Again, they've got a 99% job placement rating year after year, so they are providing the skills uh, that employers are seeking. Um, so that is something, an area I support, our regional tech centers at the high school level as well. Um, I supply welding supplies to a couple of those schools, uh, so I'm in there frequently. Uh, seeing what's going on and uh, you know they're they're doing a heck of a job in some of those areas and uh, you know we just need more of that um, need to support them where we can and uh, keep that going do you think that Vermont should focus on developing more housing in compact like downtown village settlements instead of spreading out in, in rural areas well, I'm not opposed to building in rural areas. Um, I would prefer to see, you know, prime farmland stay farms. Um, you know, the most tillable land um, where we can grow crops and um, food, you know, to feed the state um, should be preserved. Uh, you know, there's less desirable land for farming that could be built on. A um, hundred years ago, most of these hillsides were bare pasture, um, only about 20% wooded. And now we're about 80% wooded and 20% bare. Um, so it's landscape has changed. Uh, I would like to see more redevelopment of downtowns um, with housing and you know whether it's above a storefront or um, you know that's permits again are an issue that's preventing some of that. Getting back to your roots growing up on a dairy farm I know one of the biggest challenges for Vermont dairy farmers is the price of milk that they get paid which is largely determined by national national factors. Yeah. Do you, do, you, do you see any solutions for, for Vermont in terms of 
making sure that farmers get uh, a good price for the milk that they're producing? Yeah, that's uh, to been a tough one for, it really hasn't increased much over the decades um, compared to costs. So farms have gotten bigger um, to be more efficient and the small ones have gone out of business or switched to other products. Um, you know, for example, you know, it's easy for a dairy farm to switch from dairy to beef because they've already got the equipment to produce hay, for example, and um, they know cows. Um, but uh, from a milk standpoint, you know, for instance, during COVID, there was a lot of milk being dumped. Um, I would like to see more availability of local milk in schools, for example. Um, I know when I was a kid, we had, had our choice of milk. Um, I preferred chocolate milk myself, but... Um, so, yeah, keeping that in the schools uh, throughout the region. Um, and, you know, trade agreements with Canada, for example, they heavily subsidize their farmers up there. Um, so making sure we have good trade agreements at the national level would be really important, but that's kind of beyond the scope of my job at this point. Um, that would be more a federal issue. Uh, what, what's your pitch to voters um, that you meet out on the campaign trail? How do, you, how do you present yourself to try and convince someone to vote for you? Right, so I'm a candidate who was born and raised here in the Upper Valley um, with decades of business experience and that experience will make me a great candidate to tackle the affordability and economic issues facing Vermont today. So if voters, voters want to learn more about you, how can they find you? Do you have a website? Yes. Uh, will you be appearing at any upcoming events? Yes, I have a website, colson4vermont.com. Um, the number four? Or, uh, or letter, or oh. spelled out, okay. F-O-R. Okay, colson4vermont. Yep. The dot com. Okay. Yep, everything's spelled out. Uh, so that gives a pretty good detail on my platform and a uh, little background and you know we're going to be out there doing events and sign waves and everybody wants to stop and chat be happy to chat with them last question what's your what's your favorite part about living in vermont i love the state you know grew up here it's home it just feels like home and i think it'll always be home and i just want to make home stay that way and um, so future generations can feel the way about Vermont that I do. Well Dana thank you very much for coming out to the studio today and for sharing your views and best of luck on the campaign trail. Yeah thank you and thank you to everybody for watching.